Thank you, Alan, for uh, the introduction. Um, I think this morning I knew what I was going to talk about this afternoon, but after the morning session and the afternoon session, I may reconfigure. Um, first thing is I don't have any disclosures, although I bought GE stock for my, uh, as an experiment for my, one of my chi children, and the other child I brought uh, BP stock. Uh, and this was on the weekend of the uh, Deepwater, Deepwater Horizon disaster. Uh, <clears throat> I uh, subsequently sold the $100 shares of each of them that I had. Some of the words that were used this morning were uh, one-offs, platforms, barriers, and engagement. And I, I, I hope that I'm going to be able to discuss the way forward and answer all the questions that people were afraid to ask this morning. Um, one of the subtitles for the discussion this afternoon is about precision value. And really when we talk about precision in personalized medicine and precision medicine, um, in high value care systems, I think what we're really talking about is precision and, and uh, accuracy. Um, precision is just the idea that we can do something repeatable, uh, repeatedly, uh, not necessarily accurately. Um, the reason I bring this out is because we're supposed to tie precision and value together. And on the left hand side of this slide, you see the, the value over quality equation that Ken Kaiser used when he was developing the system at the VA, which was a highly, uh, highly uh, effective uh, model that he developed to improve the value. So in aggregate, it's, it's cost over, uh, it's quality over cost. Well, a lot of things that we talked about this morning, particularly uh, this afternoon when we were talking about robotic surgery, may add a lot of cost without necessarily adding, uh, without necessarily value. We have to be able to assess that. That's part of the, con the mission of a continuously learning healthcare environment. We're going to talk about that. So Alan brought this slide up a few moments ago, and Alan and I have worked to, together for a number of years on some of the projects that he's talking about. They're essentially one-offs. They're one-offs about things that we care about, but what we don't what we haven't done yet is, uh, for a couple of these things, sorry, don't give a child a pointer like this. Um, for a couple of these, these tasks that we've had, we've gotten all the way to the top here, but we really, and we've started to test, but we don't have this feedback and lessons learned limb because we haven't had true clinical implementation. That's one of our chal big challenges in healthcare, is the clinical implementation while simultaneously getting feedback and lessons learned. We heard this morning that we don't really have that for robotic surgery yet, in spite of the fact a lot of people think it's a good idea. We've been doing it for a long time. So this slide comes from a, uh, a paper by Doherty in 2008 where he talks about the three T's of translation. I bring this up to say that translation is really it changed its meaning in medicine. It used to be how do you get a molecule from the bench to the bedside. And now it's a much bigger piece of the pie that we're talking about, and it was touched on this morning already. Um, in this article in, in 2008, they talk about the interoperable HIT, healthcare technology, is the essential foundation for tracking population outcomes, building patient registries, performing comparative effectiveness studies, and efficient measurement of healthcare processes, cost, quality improvement initiatives. And I think that's a string that runs through all the discussions we've had today. I'm try and use these arrows. I'm going to switch now to how we're trying to build this system, in a, at least in a test case here, and that's to take advantage of the Johns Hopkins General Electric Command Center that's just on the other side of the corridor here. Um, the question I'm asking is, is this or can this be an example of a system for implementation of new innovations and for performing continuous learning? And my hope is that it can. This is actually the physical space, and when you read most hospitals, they, they have some form of command center. This command center is a little bit different um, than others. It was designed largely to improve throughput in the hospital through the emergency room, but since its inception, um, we've looked for new ways to use it and increase its power. And one of the ways we could do that is suggested by a slide deck that the Institute of Medicine developed for continuous learning for safety. We've seen the comparison this morning about uh, the comparison of healthcare to other industries such as aviation where there are really very few errors that ever occur that we know about. Um, even baggage is handled in ways that would have been exceptional just a few years ago. They point out that um, 
we're able to manage complexity. The folks at the APL manage tremendously complex, non-deterministic systems where aircraft fighters can land on moving platforms and hit things that are in the air. And then what I really want to talk about now is adding control to the mission. And we call the Johns Hopkins Command Center the Johns Hopkins Command Center. John, uh, um, Conrad Grant, who's one of our colleagues at the APL, said we really should be talking about command and control centers. And in other industries, we do have mission control centers. So this is a slide that Jeff Terry, one of my colleagues at GE, put together, sort of describing what our hope for mission is using the command center, where we go from the current state where we have simple monitoring to being able to develop <coughs> war rooms and perform continuous multi-parameter monitoring and documentation, that we're able to develop enhanced visualization, communication, and that eventually we get to this spot here where we have an interoperable smart hospital system that increases productivity, quality, and decreases cost. When we decrease cost and improve quality, we're talking about value. Along the way, we hope to invoke precision medicine, personalized medicine in ways that we're just thinking about now. The model system that we're going to try and attack first is one that we think has high value in terms of improving patient outcomes and decreasing costs, and that's sepsis. Sepsis is an important healthcare problem. It's, it's really one of the most avoidable causes of patient death, and there's a 50% relative reduction in mortality if we simply treat sepsis the way we know it should be treated, and yet we don't do that here. We don't do that across the country. So there's lots of places that are trying to fix this problem of sepsis management. Um, right now, we have an electronic medical record. The idea is that we can ingest that data and bring it into our command center where we'll be better able to visualize risk and then develop a new role, at least for Johns Hopkins, where we have a clinical expediter who can use that information to follow up or prompt the clinical team to act if they're not already acting, if they're not following best care procedures. What's new about this is probably the least defined of these lines, which is the continuous learning model. Because if we're tracking this data in the command center, then we can do research and measurement on our performance. A lot of the research and measurement is already done for core measures. But that's probably not enough to know how we're really performing in terms of improving sepsis care. As we started talking about this model, it became clear to us that there's already a group here at Johns Hopkins through the University of Writing School that's looking at sepsis, and they developed, this is a group led by Suchi Saria, they developed a system called the TRUE system, T-R-E-W-S, or Targeted, um, targeted uh, Response Early Warning System for Sepsis. And what they found was that their machine learning algorithm performed much better than currently available models for predicting sepsis based on um, medical record data. So this is the, I think this is the trues here. You can see this is the receiver operating curve. It performs much better than other um, non-machine learning tools like Muse that are used out in the world. So having this system of engineers at Hopkins, we reconsidered what we were doing in the command center and said this is an ideal situation because we have a research group who's developed a new tool, essentially a one-off, but if we put it in the command center, then all the work that we were thinking of doing using the standard definition of sepsis can go into the command center where we have this clinical expediter. And oh, by the way, this new machine learning algorithm hasn't been clinically tested yet. So we'll also be able to deploy it in the command center using work that this group has already done, have the clinical expediters use that data and follow it to see how it performs in real life. So this is a model that we think could be successful for um, improving the care of our patients, developing a continuously learning environment, and also encouraging innovation in a way that can be tested. This is what the <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> conceptual diagram looks like. And I put this up because each one of these, each one of these boxes is basically a, a functional unit in this um, in this context diagram. The black ones already exist. So there are six block diagrams here. The, the, black, the black ones already exist. I'm sorry, the black ones don't exist. Um, 
except that they kind of do. So there's a sepsis uh, whiteboard. The TRUES team already has that. This is the TRUES module plugging in. We have the EHR. We have the clinical team. They're all going to interact in a collaborative way here, taking advantage of what we already have, which is the command center workforce, the standard tiles of the command center. We'll develop a new communication module, and we already have this EHR interface. This is the timeline that we have for rapid implementation. We think we can start to get data out of this system, baselining first and then looking at performance in about an 8 to 12 month timeline. And this is my last slide. We really think of sepsis and putting this work in the command center as the Trojan horse. And I like the Trojan horse analogy because as, uh, as one of the speakers said in the last session, it's technology enabling people. And the Trojan horse is a great example of technology that enabled people. Um, these same soldiers who got out of the Trojan horse in, in Troy, uh, these were Athenians, um, were fighting for many, many years against a, a gate, against a wall. And they were unsuccessful. There was a lot of death and carnage. You can see that in all the planes that are falling out of the sky in healthcare now. But as soon as they used this technology to get into uh, Troy, they were able to very quickly and swiftly uh, slit all the male Trojans next and, uh, and be successful. So we think of this as a simple model like the Trojan horse where we can start to demonstrate uh, the use of a standing platform to improve health care, showing value, um, and then enabling more precise medical treatment. Uh, most importantly, I want to acknowledge the many people who have helped on this project, particularly Peter Pronovost at the AI, Alan at the, at the um, APL, and many people in the um, command center, Dave Efron, Mary Margaret Jacobs, Jim Shulin, and then Jeff Terry from GE. The TRUES team I just mentioned is uh, led by Nishi Roat, um, but has I'm sorry, led clinically by Nishi Roat, the engineering uh, manpowers through Suchi Saria's team. So thank you very much.